So this is Romans chapter 1, the scripture for the 2nd of September. The book of Romans is Paul's crowning theological treatise, containing many of his strongest, most sustained, and mature arguments for justification by faith alone, righteousness through Christ alone, and the magnitude of God's grace. One of the practices I have when reading scripture, and I got this from one of my mentors and teachers in seminary named George Hunsinger, a renowned scholar on Karl Barth, a German theologian. Uh, George Hunsinger is a phenomenal interpreter of God's grace and scripture and theology. And, and he says that it's important to interpret the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. To interpret the New Testament, including the Gospels, through the lens of the Epistles. To interpret the Epistles through Paul, and to interpret all of Paul through Romans. In many ways, the book of Romans is a linchpin for the development of Christianity, which means if we get it wrong here, we're going to get it wrong uh, all the way down. Um, so if I'm going to be honest with you, interpreting Romans is a, uh, difficult for me. It, it, the book of Romans is such a meaningful book, and I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, so I'm feeling a little bit apprehensive and trepidatious. Romans, when interpreted right, can set, up, set off a new reformation. Romans, when interpreted wrong, can lead to abuses of the faith. So in, in Romans 1, um, uh, actually in, in all of Romans, uh, Paul's writing normally, uh, it's assumed around 60 AD or AD 60. Um, and it, it's written as a letter of encouragement and introduction to the believers in and around Rome. Rome is the seat of the Roman Empire at this time. Uh, so Paul is... Uh, excited to go and preach the gospel there. Paul opens his letter with a long list of credentials, tying Jesus to the Jewish faith through King David, and then using language reminiscent of Jewish prophets to describe himself. It's pretty clear that, that he's thrown his whole uh, resume at these believers right off the bat so that they'll listen to him. In Romans, both Paul's content and his structure is important to take note of. He begins this letter with gratitude. Gratitude for the privilege both of knowing and of bearing witness to the gospel. As a believer, he recognizes God's hand on his life throughout his life and can see the influence of others who've shaped and formed him also. And he's intent to tell the Romans that God's gospel is for everyone, regardless of ethnicity, nationality, or background. God's gospel is for you. Now we can see God's people, Paul suggests, by observing how people live. If they rely on faith and if they live looking for something more meaningful than life here, if they live by faith, then they truly believe. If they trust in God's power instead of their own, they can be considered righteous. One of Paul's favorite Old Testament references is this uh, uh, passage, the righteous one or the righteous shall live by faith. It's from Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Paul uses it in a number of places, including here in Romans. But without faith, humans are driven to find meaning elsewhere. It's how we're wired. We're meaning-making creatures and we want something to worship. Now in Paul's time, meaning was found in temples. And many temples had worship rituals that were based around sex. This is why, for Paul, idolatry and sexual, uh, sexuality are, are so closely linked. That's how it was in his culture, and I think it's true sometimes in our culture as well. Love and desire have major implications about one's worship. That's why if, if uh, somebody is really excited about their country, that's fine, but we got to be careful to not to allow our patriotism to tend toward idolatry. One quick note um, about this passage in Romans. The apparent reference to and condemnation of same-sex relations here can be a bit mis misleading to Western eyes. Unnatural intercourse in Paul's day referred more to immoderation in sexual acts rather than orientation. Uh, you know, engaging in sex too much rather than engaging in sex with the wrong person. Now, as far as men, some of Paul's logic uh, may be regarding the, the Roman practice of pederasty, where an older man would mentor a younger man. Uh, and I talk more about this in the video on 1 Corinthians 6, which I've linked in the comments. In any case, those I know 
in same-sex marriages don't appear to fit Paul's description of those who are in rebellion against God in verses 29 through 32. And I think that um, the righteous shall live by faith is another way of saying by their fruit, we will know them. And if same-sex couples are bearing good fruit, perhaps it's not same-sex relationships that are being condemned by Paul here. Now I wonder, how does your faith govern how you live? That's all for Romans chapter 1. Tomorrow on the 3rd of September, we'll be looking at Romans chapter 2. May God bless you in your reading of Scripture.